Hey guys, so today we're going to be tackling John chapter 15, and many of you know that this passage is near and dear to my heart because the Lord used my fear and confusion over this passage to blow wide open my understanding of the Bible, specifically around the nation of Israel and how we are to understand Jesus's parables. And I know that many of you also struggle with fear and confusion over this passage because those who believe that you, you can lose your salvation will often use John chapter 15 as a proof text to teach that, all right? Now, make no mistake, there is a clear warning in John chapter 15 that we can't overlook, um, but we need to get to the bottom of what that warning is, what Jesus is trying to tell us, and who he's speaking to. And hopefully by the end of this video, you will have greater clarity on that issue by understanding Jesus's words in their cultural context. And so therefore you can walk away with some peace and hopefully better understanding um, about the Bible as a whole through this passage, the way that God granted to me. All right, so I really highly recommend that you guys follow along with me in your Bible, whether it's a physical copy or an online copy. Um, we're gonna be going through a lot of different scriptures. We're gonna be cross-referencing scripture with scripture. And I don't want you guys just listening to my voice. I'm a nobody, okay? Don't trust me. I want you to read this with your own eyes and hear it with your own ears in the word of God. That's where the power is. That's where the truth is. I'm just a person, okay? Don't trust me. I want you to read this in the word of God for yourself so that you can really understand it, all right? We're gonna be going through five different chapters of the Bible, doing what I often do on this channel, rightly dividing the word of truth, using scripture to interpret scripture, the Bible to interpret the Bible, okay? And we're, I'm gonna give you those five different chapters, bookmark them out, pause the video if you need to, that way you can quickly cross-reference between those chapters, okay? Um, the five chapters are Isaiah 5, Isaiah 27, John 15, Romans 11, and Luke 13, okay? We're gonna be going back and forth between them, so mark them out and read along with me so that you can get the full gist of what uh, is being said. So we're starting in John chapter 15, verse one, Jesus speaking. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now I'm gonna stop here in verse six, because this is the verse that trips people up. This is the warning passage that Jesus is giving in verse six. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Jesus brings your attention to this concept of abiding in him that apart from him, you can do nothing, that only the branches that are rooted in him and nothing else will produce fruit. Any branch abiding in something other than him will die and wither and be cast into the fire. Apart from him, you can do nothing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but by me, okay? Jesus is making a very clear warning that anyone who is trusting in something or anything other than him, the true vine, will be cut off and cast into the fire. That means Moses, your own righteousness, some false god, some false religion. There is only one name under which all men shall be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. He is the narrow gate. Only the sheep entering by him shall be saved. Everyone else trying to get into the kingdom by some other way is a thief and a robber. So Jesus brings attention to this concept of abiding in him. This word abide, what does it mean? It means to dwell in. Dwelling in him and he in you. It's a reference to trusting in him and him alone and in nothing else. Because apart from him, the true vine you can do nothing. Like a branch severed from the root, which is the life-giving nutrients of the tree, 
you will wither and die apart from him. He is the source of life. He is the root, the true vine, the trunk of the tree. And so only the branches in him, it's a reference to trusting in him, only the branches in him will produce the fruit unto life. Any branches rooted in something else will produce fruit unto death. They will die. They will be cut off, wither, and cast into the fire. Okay? So Jesus is making a clear warning to those who would abide in something other than Jesus, who would be tempted to abandon Christ and go back to Moses. Okay? Now, what I just said is the, is the direct context of what Jesus is referring to. He's making a clear warning that there will be some, like in his parable of the sower, who at first seem to receive the gospel with truth, but those very same people, when persecution comes, will head right on back to Moses and to Judaism. Because this is what takes place in the biblical narrative in the time of Jesus and in the apostolic age. This is the reason why the book of Galatians was written. It was the reason why the book of Hebrews was written. All right. Jesus is saying that the servant is not greater than the master. Those who persecuted me, they will persecute you for my namesake. Who are the ones that persecuted Jesus? Who were the ones that put him on that cross? Guys, it was the unbelieving Jews. And it was those same people who persecuted the followers of Christ after Christ's crucifixion. And many of those people that claimed the name of Christ, but were not rooted in him, the parable of the sower, they had no root. When persecution came, would abandon him rather than abiding in him and run head back to Judaism and Moses. And what does he say? Any branch that does not abide in me will be cut off and cast into the fire. It's not that these people lost their salvation, guys. It's the parable of the sower. At first, they seemed to receive it with joy, but they had no root. Who's the root? He's the root. They weren't rooted in Jesus. They were rooted in something else, right? One foot in Moses, one foot in Jesus. That person's not abiding in Jesus. They're trusting in something other than him. And he and he alone is the source of life. A branch that's not rooted in the trunk, in the vine, will die. Because he and he alone is the source of life, okay? It's not a person losing salvation. This is a person who is in the parable of the sower who has no root. They're not rooted in him. He's the root, as we're going to read in Romans chapter 11, okay? Okay? So we're going to get into deeper detail about this warning later, but I want to bring your attention to verse one of this uh, chapter. All right. Jesus says something very interesting. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Notice Jesus does not just simply say, I am the vine. He says, I am the true vine. He adds, he adds an adjective there. That's very important. He's saying that I am the true vine and that there is a false vine. Otherwise, he would just have simply said, I am the vine, but he doesn't. He says, I'm the true vine, which means he's contrasting himself, the true vine, from a false vine, a false system that only produces death. So who is this vine, this false vine? Who is the vineyard of God that when God expected it to produce fruit, produced nothing but sour grapes, rotten fruit? Who is this vineyard, this false vine? All right, let's find out. Because Jesus starts John chapter 15 in the very first verse, contrasting himself, the true vine, with this false vine. So if we want to understand John chapter 15, we got to understand what he's getting at. Who is this false vineyard, this false vine? Follow with me in Isaiah chapter 5. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. A well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. Notice that Jesus tells almost an identical parable in the Gospels of what you're reading here in Isaiah chapter 5. This is what I mean when I say Jesus isn't coming up with words out of thin air. He's repeating from the prophecies. He's repeating from Jewish holy books. He's speaking to Jewish people from their holy books, okay? Jesus is repeating in his parable of the vineyard 
the words of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 5. Who is Jesus speaking about in his parable of the vineyard? Well, we'll find out here in Isaiah chapter 5. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth rotten grapes. Some translations say sour grapes, okay? Oh no, oh now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard than I have not that I have not done to it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth rotten grapes? And now please tell me, you, excuse me, and now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned, and break down its wall and it shall be trampled. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up thorns and briars. I will also command the clouds that they rain not on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So no surprise here. You didn't really need verse 7 to know who it was talking about. But the barren vineyard is the nation of Israel. Okay, And the nation of Israel, this barren vineyard that never produced fruit or produced sour fruit, rotten fruit, is a representation of the old covenant system which they subscribe to. The law of Moses, which they never kept, never saved anyone, never produced fruit unto life, only produced fruit unto death, okay? This vineyard is representative of the old covenant system and the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? This system never produced life. And Israel represents this system because they are adhering to it, not understanding that the entire purpose of the Old Covenant system was to point people to its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And this is why Jesus says, On the day of judgment, it will not be I who condemns you, but it will be Moses who you have trusted in. Who does he say that to? He says it to the Jews. They're rejecting him in favor of Moses, thinking that in Moses they will have eternal life. But that system has never saved anyone. It's never granted life. It's never justified a single man. It's only condemned and killed. It never produces life. It only produces death. You will know a tree by its fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. The law is the strength and power of sin. It in itself is good and holy, but it is not capable of producing good fruit in men. It can only produce condemnation and death. And the unbelieving nation of Israel is representative of this old covenant system. Okay? Their system is based on the law, not in faith. Okay? Every step of the way, Israel lacked faith. At Mount Sinai, they worshiped the golden calf. In the wilderness, they grumbled and failed to trust in God. And every step of the way, they died because of their lack of faith. Okay, you've got to understand that what Jesus is saying in John chapter 15, in the very first verse, with I am the true vine, contrasting himself from the false vine, which Israel is and represents, Jesus is saying that there are two ways that you can go. There are two paths that you can go. You can go the narrow way or you can go the broad way. One way leads to life and few find it. One way leads to destruction and many are on it. He himself is the narrow way that leads to life. He is the tree of life, and he can only produce fruit unto life for those who abide in him, trust in him, and in him alone. But for those, the many, who are trusting in something other than him, their own righteousness, the law of Moses, religion, religiosity, some false god, some false system, any way other than Jesus... They should not expect to produce fruit unto life, but they will wither and die for Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of life. So Jesus starts John chapter 15 with a contrast between himself, the narrow way, the tree of life, versus the false way, the broad way, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the entire old covenant system that Jesus or that uh, Israel represents, okay? Their lack of faith, they're adhering to the law of Moses, not understanding that God's covenant, the new covenant, which he um, ratified in Jesus, is a covenant of faith. It's not based in the law, all right? So, 
Now we want to talk about these branches, all right? We want to talk about verse 6 in John chapter 15. Who are these branches that Jesus is referring to? He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out or cut off as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Guys, you need to understand that this is the warning that Paul is giving in Galatians to those who were abandoning the purity of the gospel message, trying to trust in Moses, trying to add Moses into the gospel message. He says, you have been cut off from Christ. He says that in the book of Galatians, you have fallen from grace. You are cut off from Christ. You have to understand that he's referencing the words of Jesus here. Those who in the church of Galatia were trying to spy out the liberty of the Galatian church, pervert the simplicity of Christ, draw people away from Jesus and back to Moses, who were infiltrating and spying out the liberty of Christians, who were um, experiencing the, the Sabbath rest by trusting in Christ and Christ alone, and we're trying to infiltrate the law of Moses back into the church, circumcision, the dietary practices, trying to make people feel like they had to be justified by adding the law to the gospel message. He gives to them the warning that Jesus gives in John chapter 15. You are cut off from Christ. You have fallen from grace. This is the parable that Jesus is 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 uh, this is the parable of the sower that Jesus is trying to tell us um, with those who at first received it with joy, but when persecution came, they abandoned Christ because they had no root. Only those who know that Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of life. Those people, when persecution comes, ain't nothing ripping them from Jesus's hands. Because they know that he and he alone is the source of life. Moses can't grant that to them. Judaism can't grant that to them. They know because they're rooted in him. They have root in him. They've abided in him. They know that there is no other name that we might be saved but by Jesus. That there is no life in any other way. That he and he alone is life. Okay? This is the, the, the influence of John chapter 6 when... All of those who were following him around because he was doing miracles and he was feeding them, they turned and they left Jesus. And Jesus looked to the, tw uh, to the his disciples and he said, are you going to leave me too? And their response was, where else would we go, Lord? You are the only one with the, with the words to eternal life. That's what it looks like to be rooted in Jesus and not be rooted in something else. The others, they left. As soon as the going got tough, they abandoned Jesus. Jesus who? Why? Is it because they were saved and then stopped being saved? No, they were never rooted in Jesus. They never understood their need of him. They never understood the gospel and truly received it and believed it. Because those who do, they're not going to be rooted in something else because they know that Jesus and Jesus alone is the only way. All right? Um, now, I want you to understand, guys. Jesus is, is, is prophetically speaking to his disciples here in John chapter 15. Jesus is saying that the servant is not greater than the master. Those who persecuted me will also persecute you. Who persecuted Jesus, guys? Who were the ones that put Jesus on that cross? The Jews. And who were the ones that after the crucifixion began persecuting the early church? Their families were deserting them. They were confiscating their goods, killing them and putting them under trial, dragging them before the synagogues. Who were the ones doing that, guys? the Jews who say they are Jews, but they lie, the synagogue of Satan. Guys, it was the Jews that Jesus was warning about in John chapter 15. They are the branches that were cut off because of unbelief and cast into the fire. And more than that, many of the people that um, were hearing Christ's words were going to be tempted to abandon and not be rooted in his words and be brought back to Moses by these Judaizers that were coming in and spying out the liberty of the church, trying to draw people away from a pure faith in Christ and pervert the simplicity of the gospel to draw people away from Christ back to Moses. And Jesus was saying, don't let that happen. There is no life outside of me. There is no life in the old covenant system. Moses does not offer you the fruit unto life. The Jews died in the wilderness. The manna that Moses gave did not sustain the Jews. They died in the wilderness. 
eat of this bread and you will never die. He's contrasting Moses with himself. He's saying, don't go back. There is no life for you there. Abide in me. Stay with me. Be rooted in me. Do not go back because he was prophesying that that very thing would take place, that many people would have at first heard the message with joy, but they weren't rooted in him. They didn't understand their need of him. And just like in John chapter six, they would desert him. And only those who were rooted in him, who truly understood their need of him, would stick around, all right? And this is what Galatians and Hebrews was written to address, the very thing that Jesus was warning about here, that would, in short order, Judaizers would infiltrate the flock and be drawing people back to Moses, drawing them away from the, the way of truth, pervert the simplicity of Christ, and try and bring them back to a religious system that has no power to save, okay? All right, so let's go to... Um, Isaiah chapter 27, because we want to really nail this point home about who these branches are that are cut off and cast into the fire. So Isaiah chapter 27 is all about, uh, I don't want to go into too, too much detail because I could make a whole video just on this passage alone, all right? Um, there's just a couple of verses I want to share with you. But the overall gist of Isaiah 27 is this concept of two Israels. There's the false vine, and then there's the true vine, true Israel, which is Jesus Christ. There's the nation of Israel, the fleshly nation, and then there's true Israel, which is Jesus Christ. Um, false Israel will fail and become desolate, but there will be a, a true root that comes into Jacob, a true Israel, and that is Jesus Christ, and he will fulfill He will fill the whole world with fruit. He is true Israel, okay? That's the basic gist of Isaiah chapter 27, but I want to bring your attention to verses 10, 11, um, in this in this chapter to try and identify who these uh, withered branches are, okay? So here we are in Isaiah 27, verse 10. Yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed and there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its bows are withered, they will be broken off the women come and set them on fire. Now, this word here in verse 11, um, if you're reading the King James or the New King James, that's translated into English as bows. If you actually look into the Hebrew word, it refers to branches, okay? Um, the translators of Old English use this word bows. We don't really use this word in modern English anymore, but it refers to branches. And if you look at the Hebrew word there in verse 11, it's a reference to branches, okay? Um, the more, some of the more modern translations will say branches or twigs, but the word there, don't be tripped up, bows, it actually refers to branches. So it actually says this, when its branches are withered, they will be broken off. The women come and gather them and set them on fire. That's the exact language Jesus uses in John chapter 15, verse six about the branches who are cut off, withered and cast into the fire, okay? So who are the branches that Jesus is referring to here in Isaiah 27? Well, guys, the whole chapter of Isaiah 27 is talking about the nation of Israel. And the clue here is in verse 10, when he says, yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed and there it will lie down. So Isaiah chapter five talks about this uh, vineyard that God will remove its hedge, that it'll tear down its wall, that it'll make it desolate. This is what happened in 70 AD, guys, with the sacking of Jerusalem. That fortified city that verse 10 is referring to, that's Jerusalem. It will become desolate, forsaken, it'll become a wilderness. It's what happened in 70 AD to Jerusalem. This was a prophecy about that moment. So verse 10 here is reiterating what Isaiah chapter five said, guys, the branches that were broken off, this is referring to the nation of Israel, the unbelieving, unfruitful, unfaithful nation of Israel. They are the people in verse 11 who have no understanding, where it says, for they are a people of no understanding. They are the blind, deaf, and dumb that Isaiah talks about. Therefore, he, made, he who made them will not have mercy on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. I suggest that you take the time to study Isaiah chapter 27, because there's a lot of uh, good fruit here. There's a lot of information here about um, 
the nation of Israel versus Jesus, who is true Israel, um, etc. Isaiah is just a treasure trove. I love Isaiah. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's probably my favorite book of the Bible. Um, but I want to take you now to Romans 11 so that I can really cement this point home that the broken off branches are the unbelieving Jews and that, that they were broken off because of their unbelief, their lack of trust in Christ. They rejected him. And this is why they were broken off. Okay. So Romans 11 is all about Jews versus Gentiles. That's what that's the context of Romans 11. He's speaking to Gentiles about how the natural branches, the Jews, were broken off because of unbelief, and the foreign branches, the Gentiles, were grafted in because they stand in faith, okay? That's the whole context of Romans 11. It's the mystery of God's salvation, how um, God will save a remnant of the Jews, but right now there's a partial hardening over them, and because of their unbelief, they've been cut off but the Gentiles have been grafted in by faith, all right? That's the whole point and premise of Romans 11. I'm trying to save us time here so we don't have to go through the whole chapter. But I want to bring you to uh, verse 13 of Romans 11. And Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, that I might magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh, the Jews, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Notice that word casting away. It's exactly what Jesus says in John 15, 6. Um, those who don't abide in me will be cast off, cast away, and thrown into the fire. Who are the cast away in Romans 11 here? The unbelieving Jews. Why were they cast away? Because they didn't believe. Paul goes on to say that very thing. Now, verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Who are Who's the root? He's the true vine. Who's the first fruit? It's Jesus, guys. He's the first fruit. He's the root. He's the true vine. And the passage says here in verse 16 that if the root is holy, so are the branches. Understand that's exactly what Jesus is saying in John chapter 15. Only the branches in me produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The root is holy, so are the branches. So therefore, any branches that aren't in him, because they have, they're not in him by belief, they haven't entered by faith, they will be cast off and cut, cut off and thrown into the fire, okay? You're in him by faith. That's what abiding in him means. You're trusting in him, okay? If you don't believe, you're not in him. You're cast away as a branch, cut off and cast into the fire. But if you're in him, because the root is holy, so are the branches. He is the source of life. So a branch that's rooted in him has life. A branch that's not rooted in him has not life. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son has not life. John, uh, First John, okay? Guys, the Bible interprets the Bible. We've got to remember that. All right, so here we go. We're talking about these branches again. I mean, this is clearly written in scripture, this concept of branches, but nobody's applying Romans 11 to what Jesus says in John chapter 15. Why? Why is that? I don't know. Let's find out. All right. So verse 16, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you Gentiles being a wild olive tree were grafted in with them and became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, the ones that were broken off, the native branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So Paul is saying, you Gentiles, do not boast because you've been grafted in and the Jews have been broken off because of their unbelief. For you have not been grafted in because God loves you more than the Jews. God is not a respecter of persons. You are no more worthy or righteous than they are. You are only holy because the root is holy and you stand by faith and they stand in unbelief. The root supports you. You don't support the root. The root is your only way of boasting. You do not have the right to boast over the Jews who were cut off because of unbelief. You're not, you're not more righteous or holy than they are. The only reason that you are received and they are not is because you've put your trust in the root and the root makes the branches holy. So do not boast, is what he's saying here. All right, verse 19. You will say then, branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Branches were broken off, guys. What branches were broken off? The native branches. 
Why were they broken off? Because they were native. The whole concept that Jesus is telling you about branches that were broken off, that should give you a clue in and of itself. Can a wild foreign branch be broken off from a tree that it was never in to begin with? No, only native branches that were part of the tree can be broken off. How can the Gentiles who are a wild foreign branch, who are not natively in the tree, have been broken off? Only the native branches, aka the Jews, who were in the tree because they were God's first, they were the ones that received the Torah and the prophets, they were the ones that were given the law, only they could be broken off because they're the native branches. Foreign branches were never in him. The concept of being broken off is specific to the Jews in that passage, okay? So it says then, you will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. So here we have the definition of the fruit. The fruit that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15. We're going to get more into that when we go to Luke 13. But here we have a clue about what that fruit is. It's faith, guys. The reason that the branches were broken off in John chapter 15 is because of unbelief. It says it right here in verse 20 in Romans 11. The branches were broken off because of unbelief. It's not because they weren't repenting of enough sins. It wasn't because they weren't doing enough good works. They weren't keeping the, wall, the law well enough. None of that. The branches were broken off because of unbelief. That's what it says. And who are the branches that were broken off because of unbelief? The Jews. They are the ones who rejected him. Okay? Um, so this gives us a clue to what that fruit is. We're going to get more into that in Luke 13. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Now, this passage people will take to see, see? Well, the, the Gentiles, if you, if, you don't, um, if you don't do this or you don't do that, uh, then he'll break you off, that you can be broken off at any moment. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. In Romans 11. He's not talking about individuals. He's talking about groups of people as a whole. Jews versus Gentiles. The Jews as a whole have been cut off, but individual Jews haven't been cut off. Uh, Paul is a Jew. John is a Jew. James is a Jew. They're not cut off. He's Paul isn't speaking about individuals in this passage. He's speaking about nations and people groups as a whole being cut off. The Jews as a whole have been cut off because of unbelief. Likewise, the Gentiles as a whole have been grafted in. Does that mean that every Gentile is grafted in? No, most Gentiles are in unbelief. But the Gentiles as a whole have been grafted in by faith. He's not talking about individuals here. He's talking about people groups as a whole. All right, don't misunderstand this. What Paul is saying here. Is when he says, um, uh, uh, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off, is he's referring to the fact that just as God cut off the Jews, he can also cut off the Gentiles, for God is not a respecter of persons. The whole point that he's making here is don't boast the Gentiles were not brought into God's plan of salvation because God loves them more. What God did to the Jews, he could also do to the Gentiles. Don't boast. Don't be conceited. Don't be haughty. God doesn't love you more than the Jews or the Jews more than you. What he did to the natural branches, he could also do to the foreign branches if you were to be in unbelief. The point that he's making here is that Neither the Jews nor the Gentiles are better than the other. It's all about the root. God is not a respecter of persons. So therefore, do not boast. Do not think that because you are grafted in, that you have replaced or you're better than the Jews. Because it's never been about Jews and Gentiles. It's about the root. All right? If the root is holy, so are the branches. This can also be considered a warning to those who would abandon Jesus to go back to Moses because they had no root. But the broader context here is that Paul is speaking at, to Jews and Gentiles as a whole. Now, yes, there are some people who are 
would, would have been in uh, the congregation Paul was speaking to who were like Judas, who never really were rooted in Jesus. And when persecution came, because they were trusting in something other than Jesus, they would head right on back to Moses. And to them, that is a warning because outside of Jesus, there is no life. There is no life in Moses or the old covenant system. But the direct context of Paul's words here are Jews and Gentiles as a whole, nations as a whole. So this should not be used out of context to threaten individuals that they're going to lose their salvation. That's not the point Paul is making. The point is that Paul is making is that God is not a respecter of persons, that if he cut off the native branches because of unbelief, he would do the same thing to the Gentiles as a whole. Don't boast. God doesn't love you more than the Jews. You haven't replaced them, okay? For those who think that I teach replacement theology, I don't. I just rightly divide the word of God. It's always been about Jesus, not Jew and Gentile. Jesus is true Israel, okay? So only the branches in him make up God's Israel. Be they Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter because God is not a respecter of persons. It's not about Jew and Gentile. Nobody replaced anyone. It's always been about Jesus, the true vine. I do not taste I do not teach replacement theology. I teach that Jesus has been always from the beginning the true seed of Abraham. And therefore, anyone that's in him, be they Jew or Gentile, are God's Israel. It's not a replacement of the Jews. It's never been about the Jews. It's always been about the seed of Abraham, which is one man, not many. So therefore, you must be a branch in him to inherit eternal life and the promises. And so whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you get the same promises. Because the promises were made to Abraham's seed, singular, not Abraham's seeds, multiple or plural. That's in Galatians 3. That's not my opinion, okay? So now let's talk about this concept of fruit. Let's go back to this concept of fruit. What is this fruit? Well, we've just got a hint in Romans 11 that the fruit is faith. The reason that the branches, the native branches were broken off was because of unbelief. The native branches are the Jews. They were broken off as a whole because they rejected Messiah. Okay. So we just got a hint there that the fruit Jesus is referring to in John chapter 15 is the fruit of faith, belief. Okay. And the barren fig tree, the barren vineyard did not produce fruit because they didn't produce faith. Just like in the old covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai, when Moses tarried, what did they do? They started worshiping the golden calf. In the wilderness, they lacked trust in God and were grumbling and moaning. And every step of the way, they lacked faith and they died in the wilderness. So is true at the coming of Jesus. Um, they rejected him and they did not have faith. This is the fruit that Jesus is referring to. It's not works. Now, to prove that to you, come with me to Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 6. And it's, it's titled, The Parable of the Barren Fig Tree. Guys, you got to remember key words. Jesus is giving you clues. Who are the fig tree? Who's the barren fig tree in Isaiah? It's the same group of people that are the vineyard. Okay, this word fig tree is a reference to the nation of Israel, to the old covenant system as a whole, to the very same fig tree in the Garden of Eden that we ate from, which was a fig tree. The knowledge of good and evil was a fig tree. And it was fig leaves that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with. Fig leaves from the fig tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this fig tree, this barren fig tree that represents the nation of Israel, which also represents the old covenant system and also represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all of which are a dead system that cannot save, cannot justify, that we were never designed to be under. We were always designed to be in the fruit of the tree of life, Jesus not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fig tree that the knowledge of good and evil produces death. And it's represented by the old covenant system, the law, which never saved, never justified, only condemns. And it's represented by the nation of Israel, which is trusting in that system. They are the fig tree. Okay. Now let's read the, the parable. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard key words, remember them. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also 
until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. So who is this fig tree? Well, we know that's the nation of Israel. And Jesus gives us a clue here. For three years, he came looking for fruit on the fig tree. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. So that means that when Jesus spoke this parable, there was approximately six months to a year left of his ministry. And who was his ministry to? Who was his three and a half year earthly ministry to? Matthew, Matthew chapter 15 tells you that Jesus came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were who he came to. They were the ones he came to looking for fruit. They are the fig tree that when he was looking for fruit, found none. The same barren vineyard that God refers to in Isaiah chapter 5. That when he was expecting it to produce fruit, he found none. Guys, you got to remember the key words. They are the fig tree. They are the vineyard. So what is this fruit? What is it that caused Israel to stand condemned? Because they had no fruit. They didn't believe. They did not have the fruit of faith. They rejected Jesus. That's the fruit. It's not works. That's not the context of the passage. The fruit he was looking for is the same fruit Jesus keeps hammering home and again and again. Time and time again, God sent the prophets and the messengers looking for fruit from the keepers of the vineyard. But time and time again, they failed to produce fruit, the fruit of faith. They worshiped the golden calf at Sinai. They grumbled and moaned and lacked faith in the wilderness. Step by step, day by day, time after time, they lacked the fruit of faith. He's not talking about their efforts to keep the law. The law is not of faith. What he desired in them was faith, and they never had it. And to this day, they don't. And many who call themselves Christians walk the same path as they do. The law is not of faith. God is pleased by faith. That is the fruit he's looking for, all right? So, if I haven't convinced you still that John chapter 15 is referring to the Jews, that the uh, branches that were broken off are the unbelieving Jews, let me definitively prove it to you. Because Jesus tells you at the end of John 15 who he's talking to. Let's start in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Remember what I said earlier in this video. Who persecuted Jesus? Who persecuted the followers of Jesus after the cross? It's the Jews, guys. It wasn't the Romans. The Romans persecuted the church much later in history. The early church was persecuted by the same ones who put Christ on that cross. It was the Jews. He's warning them about the Jews. They are the they that he's talking about here, okay? They persecuted me. They will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But also these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Again, who are the they and the there? Who did Jesus come to? I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated me and my father. Who did Jesus do the works in front of? Who were the wicked generation seeking a sign? Who witnessed all of the miracles of Jesus? Who did he come to? The law sheep of the house of Israel. That's who he's talking about. They are the they. But if I still haven't convinced you, Jesus tells you outright in the very last verse here in verse 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. That's your definitive evidence that Jesus is talking about the Jews. Were the Gentiles given the law? Who were given the law of Moses? Whose law is the their law? Guys, it's the Jews. 
Jesus is talking about the Jews. You've got to understand Jesus's parables in context. You can't rip them out of their context and create a narrative that you feel like creating. All right. I hope this brings you guys clarity and understanding about this passage and asks and causes you to ask more questions about, oh, wow, because this is what happened to me. It was like a domino effect. When I started to understand this, oh, but what about this passage? Oh my gosh, that means this about that passage. And, and it started this domino effect, which started to kind of unravel the Bible for me. And I hope it does that for you. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. Love you guys. Bye.